Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, let me uh, say I'm, I'm humbled um, and appreciative uh, to be asked to speak today. Um, and just quickly, thank you, uh, Bernita and Mark Temkin and Sudhir. Um, Sudhir, you mentioned uh, I would be teaching something about supply chain, and I probably say I'm going to learn more. Um, I continue to learn, and I'm sure everybody on this meeting probably has equal, if not better, knowledge about supply chains. <laughs> so let me start there. Um, so I was asked to uh, talk about uh, our transformation uh, journey, uh, what we were doing uh, pre-pandemic and how it may have changed uh, post-pandemic. Um, so, you know, thought a little bit about it and uh, it was a pretty interesting uh, mind uh, journey for me. And so, let me uh, move forward on the presentation. We gonna make it, who say we can? Give it all we got and prove that we can. Together we rise with positive minds. Nothing but good vibes. This is what it's like to be. Call your friends and let them know. Appreciate the love and show together. You're unstoppable. What are you waiting for? Lovesex the world's most adaptable couch. Design yours online or at a Lovesex showroom near you. We gonna make it. Great. Um, so many of you have probably uh, seen a uh, longer version of this. Um, and uh, I wanted to start with it. So and it's really about our products. If you think about Love Sack, and it'll give you context for uh, the things I will say in the future. If you think about Love Sack, uh, we really have three major product offerings. We have uh, what we call the sacks. Um, if you've been to the stores, I'm sure you're very familiar with them. Uh, we have sectionals on the right. And then of course, uh, many accessories um, that go with each of these. One of the basic principles uh, that we follow from design to delivery is about uh, a concept which has really uh, been led by our CEO and founder, uh, Sean Nelson. And we call it design for life. Uh, in in uh, acronym terms, DFL. And when you go to the showrooms, uh, when you look on our website or mobile, you know, this is something that we continue to talk about. And really what it is, is uh, how we think about sustainability. Um, these products, they really are built to last. Um, they, our goal is to keep couches from hitting the landfills. Uh, and there's quite a bit of it. Um, it's designed, so it's very high quality and we have to really think through, um, you know, how do you do something with the type of materials that literally is built to last. Uh, designed to evolve. Uh, if you think about our sectionals, um, you can literally grow your system. You can shrink your system uh, at every stage of your life journey. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of different configurations even with the same uh, product size. Uh, and then a lot of covers so you can change up and you know, the imagination can go on. Uh, and third and foremost is about the fabrics we use. You know, one of our uh, you know, visions is how do we become one of the ma major consumers of, let's say, the West Coast uh, plastic bottles? And how do we recycle that and then bring it back into our product? Um, these are main, basically the three uh, you know, big tenants of DFL. So when we think uh, about our products, 
you know, a lot of uh, folks in the press, uh, many of you prop, you know, if you know, uh, we were designed really to disrupt the furniture industry. Um, and we thought about that. So think about the traditional model. Uh, you had to carry inventory in the stores. Uh, when you order a couch, they can range any from two to three to four months to get the one you want. Um, unless, of course, you want their stock inventory, but many want to, in these days, customers want uh, personalization. Um, and the, uh, the costs um, for labor and inventory, uh, one of your biggest cost drivers uh, for furniture companies. Um, you know, we feel like these couches are typically the same, you know, one units. Uh, you have to carry it for many years and then replace. Um, we feel like the customer base, you know, can range. Uh, and there's a lot of showrooms that just don't drive the right traffic. Um, and then, of course, you know, the configurations on couches, skew proliferation can bring a lot of complexity. You know, where we want to, where we go, uh, which is our base and, and more in the future is really about how do you bring that direct or consumer experience similar to other products in the uh, e-commerce world? And how do you get it out um, in let's say seven to 10 days or less? less? Um, we have many patents. Um, even with our products. Um, so it's not replicatable. Uh, highly engineer engaged customers. Uh, it's all about, um, as one of, uh, uh, as Mark referenced, as one of our customers, whom I just recently discovered, is um, the experience from setting it up, putting on the covers, um, piecing things together, uh, and then, you know, enjoying it. So there really is a lot of high touch engagement that we like uh, for our customers to do rather than just being delivered a couch and then you sit on it. Um, we have very focused showrooms. And the reason why is we are an omni-channel uh, uh, from ground up. Um, we use showrooms for experience. We have no inventory. Um, you can order from showrooms and for education. You can order from showrooms. You can look on the web and do the same thing visually. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, they still come out of a distribution network in a direct to uh, customer model. And then of course, you know, we, we focus on a platform, a platform that will never change. Our goal, and not our goal, but our principle is, when you own a sectional, we will never uh, change this. So basically, you know, 20 years from now, if you feel like you're going to downsize, you can, you can uh, take sectionals off. Uh, if you want to increase as you, uh, you know, move on in your, um, from, you know, college and onwards, um, you can add on. Uh, so, in essence, our inventory challenges of carrying too much or, uh, you know, and worry of obsolescence, that problem, which is interesting, is uniquely uh, immaterial uh, compared to like a general merchandise company. Um, it's always the same. We, uh, at the end of the day, we have a very focused category. Um, and... Uh, Hello. Okay. Um, switching yeah, gears, like do you think about our that. supply chain? Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, we basically uh, have the following attributes. We have a manufacturing base that is global. Um, we have, we work a network primarily with logistic service providers from overseas, 
as well as the United States. Our distribution network uh, basically is comprised of currently today, three nodes. Um, we have a North American showroom network, and we also have an omni-channel customer base as uh, I had referenced showroom, mobile, and even third-party channel customers, one which uh, many of you may be aware of when you go into a Costco store. So let's talk a little bit about our situation for con context. Um, we are continuing to increase our unit growth. Um, significantly year over year. Uh, and as our brand gets stickier um, and more aware in the marketplace, we expect that growth to continue. Um, when you think about that, uh, most supply chain people say, this is complexity, um, how do you scale? Well, we didn't for a while. Um, and the reason why is it worked, how we worked was it worked with one distribution center, one supplier, and probably a combination of less than five SKUs. Um, as we've uh, increased our SKU count, um, as we've increased our manufacturing base, as well as our DC node network, um, what we found ourselves doing was solving one, uh, what I call the um, issue, and then moving on to another issue. And we were always um, basically managing the now and managing uh, and it when it was too late versus and reacting versus uh, looking ahead and managing constraints outside our supply lead time. And so we were really challenged when the demand grew faster than our ability, uh, our supply chain infrastructure processes and so forth. Our, as we looked at, into our supply chain, um, what we recognized, and this is a pretty interesting thing for organizations like Alovesac that are now just getting into the, the uh, the new growth mode, um, the pandemic really uh, validated our, our primary um, strategic efforts uh, to transform, but what it really said was we got to go faster. Um, we were focused on how we set up redundant manufacturing facilities in different locations, geographies. Uh, we had already been focusing on developing processes uh, to manage by exception and less about the transaction. Um, I had the unique uh, opportunity where here's a company that had very simple processes, uh, very little sacred cows, and so with my experience, um, I afforded the ability to literally what I call leapfrog. How do you go from a basic process that's fairly um, new and transform to something world-class almost overnight? That was how I was thinking as we thought about this. You know, we, we started managing our supplier capacity and managing that far enough out uh, into their lead times. Um, we were focusing on getting better visibility um, to help us with inventory management and replenishment. Uh, you know, again, our order management uh, when we first started was highly uh, manual. Think about all the different exceptions an order can come in where whether you can't fulfill it, you have pieces that you can't fulfill an entire order, um, or you have in stock issues. Manually, the team was trying to receive them, uh, hundreds of them, and trying to figure out which DCs it needs to go to, 
uh, trying to figure out which ones to hold back. And it was uh, a highly manual process, uh, like many companies when they start. Um, we, had, we knew we needed network flexibility and we are on the path to you know, evolve our distribution network um, so we can get closer to the customer in many regions. Um, as we got more complex, um, we knew we had to uh, integrate our supply chain processes, especially in supply planning, uh, more with the marketing as their promotion planning uh, became evolved. So in essence, we, need, we knew we needed to collaborate more at the right time. Um, most companies call integrated business planning uh, SNOP that many of you are familiar with. Um, our design to delivery process, everything from design, sourcing, manufacturing, um, and then a uh, supply chain, obviously, we knew we needed a better process as we increased uh, the number of pro programs that go through uh, that, that design to uh, first to market, uh, first product to market process. Many of you know it as product lifecycle management. Um, and then finally, how do we hold our vendors accountable for performance as well as quality? Um, and our primary focus starting to design these areas, processes, business rules into these areas were, and technology requirements were, let's start with the customer. And it's a very interesting way to look at something because we as supply chain people automatically want to go to the math, figure out how to make something efficient, how to optimize. But if you think about it, if you start with what does the customer want? How do we want the experience to be? Um, it really does make you think differently uh, in many of these areas. So post pandemic, um, as we started thinking uh, about big areas that we're gonna have to rethink strategy, uh, it was supply There were three big areas that we had to rethink and reevaluate. Uh, same three areas that probably many of you are looking at, uh, or we know are look, being looked at in various industries. Uh, the first one was around manufacturing. Many, like us, uh, we were really moving towards having manufacturing facilities that could make the same, same product. And we were focusing a lot in Asia. But what we're moving to now with all the risks that we're seeing, whether it's geopolitical, uh, economic, um, is that reevaluating redundancy, not in a particular cluster of regions, but uh, in low cost, but how do we think about local manufacturing in the key markets we operate? Um, and at the same time, being able to find, uh, create that in an environment where we can be, our value chain is still cost effective. Um, the second piece was really thinking about um, how we source and thinking through sourcing from a multi-continent level versus a specific region level. Um, and then, especially in many of the things that we do. And then finally is a, a different change in the operating models um, with our suppliers. You know, as we started off, it typically is the same model that many Asian suppliers like to operate um, our size is our purchase order starts the build process. Um, we are now moving to a uh, how do we forward deploy finished goods at point of origin and start creating a pull process. Other key elements of innovation in the supply chain, which I'm really excited about is 
building strategies that say, how do we continue to improve on our sustainability um, motives, motivations, and develop ecosystems around them um, in our entire network. And it could be in the product, it could definitely be in the supply chain, as well as uh, connecting dots with our suppliers and customers. And so we are looking at um, great technology, both in our distribution centers and in the uh, manufacturing environments. And finally, from a technology perspective, uh, obviously uh, we're, we're definitely uh, moving forward on, you know, developing, modifying processes in many of these key areas. But what we do know is once those things are intact, technology really is a big uh, driver to help scale what you have. Um, let me just go through some of them. If you think about technology, uh, your journey from process journey, typically it starts manual. There's a little bit of semi-auto to auto, and then eventually to AI, which I believe will be a standard um, many years uh, in, in, in the next decade. You think about visibility, uh, this is where we were in every other processes, not just visibility, supply, how we collaborated and worked with suppliers, how we planned and replenished uh, our sales and operating process, um, how we look at communicating to customers, um, how we look at routing. Um, and then of course, very important, uh, I can't you know, stress this enough, is no matter how good your products are, you're always going to have revert returns um, that we need to figure out how do we do that in the most sustainable way. In each of these areas, we had the uh, unique opportunity that, again, no sacred cows. So it wasn't like, hey, we have um, already a spaghetti bowl in our IT network. Uh, we really, there's a lot of embedded processes. This was all about really starting at a base where we could just shape and find a strategy that help us get to um, world-class or close to it almost immediately. So that these are our uh, intentions. We're already on the journey in some of the areas, but this is where we want to end. Obviously, there's a plan to really think through how we do this, but we do think that the interactions with suppliers uh, is a very critical part of the process and probably will never change. Um, especially managing exceptions. Uh, the relationship piece, I think, is very important here that we can't underestimate. Obviously, we want to look at um, how do we do planning and replenishment uh, on a single platform um, that allows us to only manage exceptions. Um, build a process to help us uh, expedite and efficiently prepare for SNOP meetings at a quicker frequency. Um, how do we just start? Uh, because we don't even do this today, but rather than um, having to undo uh, technology, starting with the right one and getting there quicker. Um, fulfillment, we're gonna go through every step in this journey, but our intention is obviously how do we get to that end game? Same with rod optimization, uh, as similar to available to promise. And of course, we are on a journey on reverse logistics. Uh, and many options we're thinking through on this, but uh, very exciting where we're at. So I've uh, 
come to the conclusion of my presentation. Sorry about the uh, brief mute, um, but uh, I'm open to questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, Mark, additional words? Oh, um, you know, I, I think that it's super impressive that LoveSAC um, has gone into an industry that was really stayed and, and hadn't changed much and immensely disrupted it. And they disrupted it from a business model standpoint, but as you also could see from a supply chain standpoint, creating flexibility and adaptability um, that I think we can all take lessons from. And I think Tom as a leader as well is much more than just operating a supply chain, but about transforming and innovating against it. Um, so I think as you ask questions, I would urge you to think about, you know, what, how this applies to your situation or your business and how it kind of unleashes innovation, um, particularly in terms of flexibility, e-commerce, uh, and really plugging in um, ahead of time to key trends. All right. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you on, on uh, helping us and having gotten Tom to come speak for us. And with that, we're gonna start some questions. I have the first one. Oh, well, we have a devotee here of Love Sack. Brian says, Love Sack, super comfy. <laughs> <laughs> Sack or sectional. <laughs> and St. Clair Gerald, he's one of our board members, longstanding. Um, Tom, how is the West Coast portion port congestion impacting your supply chain? Uh, I think, well, the, it's not really just the West Coast uh, congestion, it's the origin. Uh, for any of you that are sourcing from the Asia region, um, obviously China, and then, you know, you see a lot of com companies now sourcing uh, from other Asian countries, uh, like Vietnam is becoming a very, very popular area. That surge, especially post-pandemic, um, companies realize China can't be our only single source for a lot of the merchandise. Um, at the same time, it, by sourcing over to the Vietnam areas uh, as our secondary uh, sourcing point for many of these companies, we were already there. Um, it really taxed their infrastructure. So we don't expect, I mean, you guys know how long it takes to build rebuild and expand port infrastructure to su support that kind of volume, especially for companies, service companies like Walmart, Target, the, a lot of the big box retailers. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the big, the big situation is there are more containers being exported from Asia, uh, less coming back. And that's really what's driving the equipment shortage, which is ultimately driving a lot of port delays. Um, think about fabrics. They have to go from, a lot of them go from China to Indonesia, China to Vietnam. They're already taxed there at the ports. Uh, and then, of course, obviously, the, to the question, you have West Coast congestion. Um, the capacity has not caught up with the ocean containers. Uh, and then the demand increased, which is really interesting because every company is trying to build inventory forward by um to protect um the uncertainty ahead and uh you know as a supply chain you know there's very few levers that you have to uh manage against it so you know obviously we're increasing lead time we're reevaluating our safety stock uh we ha we are having strategic discussions with our uh suppliers on new types of uh pull and distribution um, strategies. So there's a lot, uh, you know, um, that we're thinking through balancing both cash needs as well as um, additional expense. But we think in the long run, mitigating that risk is the value proposition there is just undeniable to if you didn't do anything and something were to happen, uh, what that would cost you. Mm. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Barbara. She says, are you direct importing and drop shipping to large retailers such as Costco or shipping from a US distribution center? 
Um, so we have many business channels, uh, but the three primary are sales channels. The three primary sales channels we have are uh, from our stores, uh, online, and mobile. And then, of course, uh, what we call our um, third party uh, partners. Um, Costco is our third party partner. So we've designed it in such a way that it's their, um, their online experience to the customer. It's their customers. So if you walk into a uh, Costco store or if you look at Costco.com, um, but in the end, our uh, systems are connected in such a way that all orders still are distributed from our distribution network. Um, and we treat those customers like if they were our customers. So again, you know, one of our strategic advantages is how do you take complexity out as much as possible and not end up with, you know, two to three different types of supply chains to support different sales channels. Okay. Um, the next question I have um, is what software do you use in your planning? ERP as an example, what module? Um, the module we use, um, so we evaluated a lot of different ones and really the focus was on who can support not only, uh, you know, what I call the middle market business, but has the ability to scale uh, to support large organizations and, you know, two, two to three billion plus type of organizations and uh, the you know, the closest thing that we could find because it was built on a common platform and not through acquisition was one network um, to support not only planning, but almost all those things that you saw. So we had the luxury again of not having to go, oh, lots of systems. How do we just replace everything? Because we know that's cost prohibitive. The kinds of things many companies deal with we're able to start from scratch and we have a common platform system. It's not piecemealed and it can re one of the biggest things about that with a uh, process that you're creating is implementation timeframe is dramatically reduced. Well, I'm going to add one question in there myself. Um, so is it a cloud platform or how is it managed? It's via the cloud. Okay. And I always say anybody who's not in that environment needs to move there. I know a lot of uh, uh, government contractors who would differ with you. <laughs> but it takes anyway. time. people are still uh, people are still asking for receipts after you yeah. uh, use a credit card. Nice. But one day. <laughs> yes. So um, the next question we have um, is uh, from. I think you may have answered this question, but I'm going to answer it, ask it anyway. Do you think you'll figure it a way around the problem with getting goods from China? Um, you know, China's still a major partner for many companies. I do not believe that will ever change. Um, they've got the talent, they've got quality and you know, it's like every country, you're gonna have at some point geopolitical risk. Um, I think the pandemic uh, made every country um, susceptible to, let's say, uh, raw material constraints. You know, you know, in the news, it's talking about major chip constraints uh, to the point where new products are launching late um, and creating massive lead times. But at the end of the day, um, I think the, the way to look at that problem is diversification, like an investment portfolio. Um, so China, I believe, should still be uh, in your import portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe a lot of the things that we are feeling now, uh, it will get through the system and eventually infrastructure catches up, uh, the economy rebuilds. And, uh, you know, they're going to be a major player in terms of uh, importing, but diversifying into other countries, uh, all the things that we talked about and uh, how we think about manufacturing um, and local uh, builds, 
uh, those are the ways that I would look at addressing uh, today's China um, uncertainty. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, from Carol, um, how long would you say was your targeted timeline where you wanted to see or hope to see a need in the product as far as consumers go? Is that is that question really about how long does it take to go from a new product idea to a to first up to to market or is that more about I guess I need to hear it again. I, I, I think I'm reading it. Okay, so how long would you say was your targeted timeline where you want to see or hope to see a need in the product as far as consumers are? So I, I take that as um, see a need in the in the uh, for a product. And then what, how long is, does it take it to, to come to fruition? But you know what, Carol, could you um, unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Hi, Mr. Lee, how are you? Hi, Carol. So my question basically was, did you um, predict a timeline, a specific timeline as far as if there was even a need, would this product be successful? Do you think that it was a need for it, a demand for it? Um, I'd like to ask a question with a question. Do you think that Apple created a smartphone thinking that there was a need for it, that the, you know, they created a need for it. There wasn't customer saying I need a smartphone. I can download apps. I can uh, eliminate 500 CDs into a little thing. That happened to me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's basically the same thing is it started with the SAC and with the principle of design for life. And when you think about that, it's really about building products on that principle. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot you can do with it. Right, the diversification of it. Absolutely. Right. Inventory uh, specialists on this call, they would love it. Mm -hmm. They would love the fact that it's very little SKUs. They rarely change. Um, and if you accidentally overorder, they don't go obsolete. Thank you so much. All right. Um, it, according to the time, we have time for uh, a few more questions. So we're going to go on with the next one from Robert Harrison. How did tariffs affect your margins? What margin impacts do you see foresee if you manufacture here in North America versus Asia? That's a really good question. Um, well, tariffs impacted pretty much everyone's margin, but an interesting thing was with the agility and the size we, with the size that we were, um, I believe personally, just working for the large organizations that I have, the ability to uh, shift and move product from one Asian country to another. Uh, we were already diversified in uh, other countries. We were fortunate we had already established ourselves in Vietnam, Malaysia, um, pre-pandemic. And again, like I said, it wasn't like, you know, most companies were, I'm in China, now I got to move to these countries. We just realized we got to build capacity and start thinking more about staying a step ahead and thinking about local manufacturing. Obviously, if we had something in the US, we're going to really think through, well, the platform and the principle is always about um, design for life, but we're going to think about things differently. And obviously, automation will play a role in that. But if you think about landed cost, if you think about, uh, you know, making a more efficient manufacturing process uh, being closer to the customer and factoring in uh, customer lifetime value, uh, it does really make a big value proposition. What if one day you could customize a couch and it gets to you in less than 10 days hmm. consistently? Oh, 
Okay, so um, I take it you're ready for the next question. Uh, Barbara are, says, uh, we're back to Barbara again, and she says, are you also exporting selling to other foreign countries? Uh, no, our market is primarily the United States. Okay, thank you. Um, and Sudhir wants to know, will your couches have IoT in them? Maybe. We don't know. I mean, there's so much, you, you know, the couches are new kitchen. Uh, that's what we're, we are uh, striving for. Um, I think there's a lot you can do if you're uh, an innovative company or if you have a lot of imagination. The, the reason I asked Tom is because cars are coming up where you sit in the driver's seat, it tells you how much weight you've gained, you know, so maybe the couch can tell me that. Great idea. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to know my weight every time I sat on the couch. Everybody would avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> it show up on your TV with like a number. Well, right after pandemic, that's good. Um, Mike Huang wants to know, can you give an example of what manual planning and replenishment solutions you have had and what solutions you're looking to implement to move into automation AI? Well, short answer is Excel. Um, and we were fortunate we have a super user of Excel. I was actually surprised what Excel could do. Had no idea. I'm just a pivot table guy. That's the most I can do. Um, the technology we chose, we looked at an end-to-end -end process. We didn't want to piecemeal it and say, by the time we get, uh, by the time we start managing inventory, um, we're just gonna to work towards weeks of supply targets, order cycle time targets, lead time, uh, safety stock and so forth. Um, we wanted to look at it from the perspective of, again, how do we buy to future demand in such a way that we're lined up with uh, the true demand of the customer, starting with the sales channels. Um, we also wanted to look at it from the perspective of if we were to plan, and obviously you need that inbound visibility, how do we convert that to a unit forecast that quickly gets to a supplier? They can just click a button and say, yes, I can do it. Um, and it comes back and automates PO management. It automates the entire inbound flow so that DCs can start managing labor um, many weeks out versus the week before. So once we decided that it was about picking planning technology that connected all those steps that I talked about. And again, that's why we chose the technology we did. Now, the cool thing about AI, and I think a lot of companies are starting to dabble in it, um, I don't believe it's anywhere near its potential, you know, at least for the next two decades is it is a learning algorithm. So, you know, our expectation is get the process right, the base business rules right, automate with technology and let the AI learn. And eventually it'll see all the exceptions. It'll learn about external factors. Um, and then it eventually takes over, probably in about the fourth or fifth year of operating that system. Okay, so Mike had a follow-up question. He says, can you share what solution gives you all of this? I already did, <laughs> in one network. Okay, oh, it's, okay, referencing one network, Mike. Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Um, uh, Mike just said, thank you. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions, but if anybody wants to send questions, you have our email address. Again, it's Apex Marketing, um, all one word, with the number one at the end at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Tom. It was great to have you speaking for us today. Do you have any final comments? Um, um, all, I can, all I wanted to say was thank you for the opportunity. Um, great questions. And... Uh, one day, I hope we cross paths uh, 
walking down the street in New York or wherever, Long Island. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, for very much for your coming on board. Uh, Appreciate it. You know, and from where I know where you are, you know, we can always try to come there and hopefully meet you there too because you live in an excellent place, you know, so. <laughs> very good.